Good morning. It's good to hear God's people fellowship. And isn't this what it's about? To come together and to uh, just to encourage each other, to lift each other's burdens, but then to get to worship together in God's house and to experience his presence as a, as a joint body of Christ. We're glad you're here this morning, and we're looking forward to what God has to tell us. So let's prepare our hearts to worship him this morning. No, we're Baptists, but y'all could have clapped for that. I heard some of y'all started, but y'all quit. Uh, it'll be all right. Uh, this morning, I just want to say welcome. If you're visiting with us, we are super glad to have you here with us. I have several announcements that I need to make, and I've been told that one of these I'm the only one who knows about, so I've got to make sure I do it right. So, December the 14th at 6.30, we're going to have a women's ministry, Christmas fellowship, and a paint party led by Trina Miller. And Angela Lawler is the contact person for that. It's $30 a person for supplies, but please swamp Angela after the service to get information on that. Um, as far as other announcements in the life of the church, most of these things are in the bulletin, but just to kind of highlight them, tonight we're having a church-wide game night. We'll start with a fellowship uh, meal at 5 o'clock, and then there'll be some dominoes. We don't allow you to play for money, but they do play for blood. So be here if you want to be a part of that. Uh, we have no Wednesday night activities this week with it being Thanksgiving. Uh, the people that are laughing are the people that have gone home with Band-Aids, so don't let them fool you. Um, we are working on a property in town. Uh, we're doing some cleanup this uh, Tuesday, I believe, uh, at, two, uh, at 1 p.m. this Tuesday here in town to clean up a property. We're going to help try to re-roof a house in town that's in need of repair. Uh, Ridgecrest Baptist from Tuscaloosa is going to come and join us uh, in the first part of December. If you'd like to be a part of that project, you think you could volunteer some time, please see Mike Enfinger after the service, and he'll give you all those details. But we could use more than just our men's construction team that can be there. And if you want to get involved in doing some hands-on ministry in the community, uh, swamp Mike after the service. There's going to be parties everywhere after the service. Um, we have our Christmas event at Oak Island the first Sunday night in December. We had a planning meeting about that this morning. I'm super excited that we get to do that. The next weekend, we have our dinner theater that Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. The next weekend, we have our piano concert recital uh, that night, the 19th, here in the sanctuary. Uh, so we've got all kinds of events going on through the month of December, including our Christmas Eve candlelight service. Um, so we just want you to be aware of our calendar and please mark it because we want you to be a part of these events. Um, this morning is a special morning uh, each year for, for my family because my wife helps lead this up at our church. But we're a collection center for the Samaritan's Purse shoe boxes for our entire area. And we box the shoe boxes up into bigger boxes and we take them to a center that has 18 wheelers in the parking lot. And they send them from there to Atlanta and then from Atlanta... Delta takes them all across the world for us and reaches people with a message of hope, the hope we have in Jesus Christ through these simple shoe boxes that you help make and do. And this morning, we want to take just a minute to pray over these boxes and celebrate that ministry so our children are going to walk these in.
Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this day, Lord. Thank you for allowing us to gather in your house to worship you. God, I thank you for these boys and girls that are here this morning that have brought these boxes down front. God, I thank you for everybody in our church who has brought, brought boxes over the last few weeks. Lord, I pray for the children who are going to be receiving them. God, that they'll receive great joy this Christmas by getting one of these boxes, Lord. Most importantly, feel your love from our church, Lord. God, I thank you so much for, for this day. And Lord, I pray for our worship service this morning, that your Holy Spirit will move throughout it. And God, if anybody here does not know you, Lord, I pray that they will come to know you this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. among the nations. You know, it's our job as Christians, it's our purpose as Christians to make sure that we sing of the faithfulness, the blessings, and the mercies of Jesus Christ. We're going to point our worship in that direction this morning. Will you stand with me as we begin with that chorus, I will sing of the mercies of the Lord. I will sing.
Father, we thank you that you give us the privilege to glorify your name. But Father, so many times we soak up your blessings. And Father, we don't do anything to allow those blessings to flow to the people around us. Remind us that that is how we glorify your name. Not by getting blessed. Not by sitting on the sidelines. Not even by studying your word. But Father, it's about putting that word into action every day and telling people about how beautiful, how wonderful, how powerful the name of Jesus is. May we do that, Father, putting your scripture into our lives and allowing it, Father, to seep out into the world around us. We ask all these things in the powerful, beautiful, wonderful name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen.
Thank you, choir, for that powerful song today. This morning we'll continue our journey in 1 Peter. We come to 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 13. We're talking about being world changers today and how we go about doing that. Let's begin reading in 1 Peter 3, verse 13. Who is there to harm you if you prove zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for the sake of righteousness, you are blessed. And do not fear their intimidation. And do not be troubled, but sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and reverence. And keep a good conscience so that in the thing in which you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ will be put to shame. Our focus this morning is verse 15, sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts. The word sanctify means to make holy. <clears throat> to be made holy is to be set aside for God's unique purposes. We are to set aside Christ as the Lord, the ruler, the master of our hearts, of our lives. What does it mean to sanctify Christ as Lord? It means to regard Him as the holiest being in the universe and to completely devote our lives to Him. Sanctify Christ as Lord. Put Him in a category by Himself. The highest place, the greatest value, the most supreme treasure, the most cherished prize and the one that you esteem and honor and love the most out of every other person or every other thing in the world. Bow before his sovereign rule. Sanctify him as Lord in your hearts. Now, when you do that, there will be evidence in your life to demonstrate that Christ is truly Lord in your life. Let, let's talk about that this morning. Number one, you'll be filled with with hope in Christ. <clears throat> you will be filled with hope in Christ. Peter talks about the hope that is in you in verse 15. Hope characterizes God. It describes God. It, it helps define who God is. He is a God of hope. He's the maker of hope and he is the giver of hope. Hope. He creates hope through the work that Christ does on the cross. He offers us hope through faith. It is a supernatural exchange. We give God our faith. He gives us his hope. And hope is not wishful thinking. The kind of hope that we're talking about is an assurance of something that is coming. To hope is to have a confident expectation that something good is going to occur. For the believer, that means that Christ is going to return one day and set up an eternal heavenly kingdom. It's going to happen. It means that, we will, that he will reward the faithful with eternal life in heaven. It means that a, a better day is coming, and we don't have to just wish for it. We can hope and rest assured that day is coming. This hope in Christ is so powerful that it changes our, our whole outlook on life. When our hope abounds and overflows, we no longer view the things of this world with priority. Our hope is not in this life. That means that material things are not as important. Personal uh, prestige and position are not as important and earthly accomplishments are not as important because this life is temporary and we're headed to our permanent home. Those who place their hope in Christ have an eternal perspective. They, they prioritize the things that will last beyond this life, the things that have eternal value, things like glorifying God and honoring Christ and serving the Lord and sharing your faith and hope with others and helping others in the love and kindness of Christ our Lord. 
So those who hope in Christ recognize the things that last are not really things at all. They are people. People are what lasts forever. They have eternal souls that live on beyond this brief time on earth. Therefore, those who hope in Christ invest themselves in relationships. Because it's those relationships that are going to last beyond this life. People last forever. They have eternal souls that live on beyond this brief life on earth. Therefore, those who hope in Christ invest in the people around them. Life is about relationships. Our relationship first with God and our relationship with others. That's why Jesus said the greatest command is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and to love your neighbor as yourself. Loving God, loving others. That's what life is about when you boil it all down. And that is where we are to invest our time and our energy and our resources. Paul tells us that hope is one of the three greatest virtues of life along with faith and love. Of course, the evil one knows this, so he's constantly trying to cause us to lose our hope. He he tries to rob us of our, our faith and our hope and love, but he can't take it away from us. So he causes us to 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 weaken our hope, to diminish our hope in Christ. And so the writer of Hebrews encourages us to let us hold fast the confession of our hope. Hope is a major theme in this little letter of 1 Peter. We've already seen this mentioned three times in the first chapter. In verse 3, he says, God has caused us to be born again to a living hope, a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And then in uh, chapter 1, verse 13, he says, fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Christ. And then in verse 21, he says, He raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. Where's your hope this morning? Where's your hope? What are you hoping in? It's a worthy question. It's so easy for us to allow our faith to weaken. And the result of a weakened faith is a misplaced hope. Sometimes we get so distracted by worldly things, we get so enticed that we don't even realize that slowly, gradually, little by little, we're putting more hope in the things of the world and less hope in God. That's why Peter warns, fix your hope completely on the grace of Christ. You can't divide your hope. Hope is not like a pie that you can cut into several pieces and say, well, I'm going to put a little hope over here and a little hope here and a little hope over here and maybe that will, that will cover it all. You can't do that. Where's your hope today? What are you banking on? A better job? More money? A bigger house? A nicer car? A better wardrobe? More recognition? Are you looking for success in the eyes of the world? Or success in the eyes of God? And do you realize that those are two entirely different things? When you sanctify Christ as Lord of your life, you will be filled with hope in Him alone. Number two, you will also be concerned about God's approval rather than the approval of others. In verse 14, Peter said, Do not fear their intimidation and do not be troubled. Peter was writing to a group of believers who were seen as outsiders in the culture of their day. They were not mainstream at all. Society looked down on them. They thought less of them. They viewed these believers as being ignorant and superstitious. Some of the believers felt intimidated by this. They felt threatened. Some were tempted to give up on their faith or just kind of keep it to themselves to have kind of a a secret faith, to be a secret follower of Christ. But Peter warns them not to fear the intimidation of their enemies. John tells us about a, a similar sort of incident that faced the early church in John 12. 
It says many of the rulers believed in Christ, but because of the Pharisees, they were not confessing him for fear they would be put out of the synagogue. That is, they'd be excommunicated from the synagogue. For, it says, they loved the approval of men rather than the approval of God. It's easy, isn't it? If we're really honest with ourselves, we would have to admit that it's easy to please people. If you're just the least bit insecure, and most of us are, uh, it's easy to want others to like you. I mean, we just we want other people to like us. And, and if you want that badly enough, you will say certain things and do certain things to elicit a positive response from the other people in your life. You've been there, right? You go along in order to, to get along. You know, let's, let's not make any waves. Let's not upset the apple cart. Let's just kind of go along with the crowd and not make for any trouble. But the problem with that is that God's way is rarely the world's way. Have you noticed that? God's people have always been the minority, always have been, and we're getting more and more the minority today. That was true in Peter's day. These early believers had to decide, are we going to go along with the majority and worship false gods? Because if we do, that could win us some friends and perhaps move up in society a little bit. But if we do that, we cannot sanctify Christ as Lord of our lives. And that leads us to the next point. When we sanctify Christ as Lord, we need to be ready to stand for Christ. And we will be ready to stand for Christ. In verse 15, Peter said, Always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you. The word Defense is key here. Peter is talking about non-believers who are skeptical and maybe a little belligerent about the Christian faith. They don't believe in Christ. Maybe they don't even believe in God, but they have taken notice that you believe. And they are asking you to give an account for your hope, to explain your hope. And this is the perfect opportunity for a believer. This is the open door for the Christ follower to, to share exactly what they believe about Christ. This is what true believers long for, this kind of opportunity for someone to come up and say, hey, you know, I've noticed that you're kind of different from the crowd. You don't go along with everybody else. And I've heard you mention the name of Jesus before. So just what is it that you really believe? Wow. It's a golden opportunity, isn't it? The door is wide open. All you have to do is walk through it. So Peter says, be ready to do that. Be ready to walk through that door to take advantage, to seize that opportunity to tell the world what you believe about Christ. Be ready to make the most of this golden opportunity. This may be your one and only chance to talk with this person about Christ. It may be their only opportunity to hear somebody tell them about Jesus. So how do you get ready for that opportunity when it comes your way? Well, let me make three or four little bullet points here. You see it there on your outline. First of all, you need to know what you believe. You need to know what you believe. Know the gospel. Know what the Bible says about Jesus. Now, that doesn't mean that you have to have the whole New Testament memorized somehow. But just be familiar with God's plan of salvation. You don't have to be a scholar. You don't have to memorize half the New Testament. Just, just know what you believe. And then secondly, know why you believe. Know why. If, if someone questions you about your faith and why you believe in Christ and you say something like, well, I don't know. It's just what I've always heard. It's been drilled into my head ever since I was a kid. Uh, that's what that preacher down at First Baptist Church says. Anyway, you know, they're probably not going to be very impressed with that, you know. So just know why you believe. And then thirdly, know how to share it. Know how to share it. 
how you say something is just as important as what you say, maybe even more so. Don't be obnoxious. Don't be a know-it-all. Don't try to pressure people. Don't be preachy. Don't be a hypocrite. Just be yourself and share your faith with others in a relaxed and warm and natural kind of way. Conversational, right? It's a conversation. And then, not only do you know how to share it, but you need to be willing to share it. Be willing. Be ready. Be willing. Be eager. The, the nearest thing to the heart of God is for someone to trust Him and to receive His gift of eternal life. And when you become a bridge between another person and God, you are in a position of tremendous blessing. There's no greater feeling in this world than to know that you have helped lead somebody to faith in Christ and to receive that gift of eternal life. Be willing. Be willing. Uh, usually it takes more than one conversation for a person to trust Christ these days. So, so be ready to, uh, to, to follow up on that person, to continue the, the dialogue. Even after they do trust Christ, you want to continue the dialogue and help them to, to keep going on in their journey of faith. Be ready to stand and speak for Christ. And then when you sanctify Christ as Lord, number four, you're going to be respectful of others. Peter said in the latter part of verse 15 there, with gentleness and reverence. This points to what we just said. You don't run roughshod over people. You don't cram it down their throats. You don't point your finger in their face and preach at them. You don't tell them that they're going to bust hell wide open. You just respect them as a person who has been created in the image of God and for whom Christ has died. Gentleness. I think is one of the most underrated qualities of God's people. Peter says, do it with gentleness. The Apostle Paul reflects that. He said in 1 Timothy 6, pursue gentleness. In Galatians 5.22, he told us that gentleness is one of the fruit of the Spirit. When you are led and controlled by God's Spirit, you will exhibit gentleness in your life. And then in Ephesians 4, Paul said, walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you've been called with all humility and gentleness. Why is gentleness so important to God? I think one reason is because it works, right? It has an effect on people because people are drawn toward gentleness. People are treated so rudely by the world today, at work, at home, at school, in the marketplace. And when they hear someone who is genuine and kind and caring and respectful and gentle in spirit, it draws them in. They want to hear. They want to hear what you have to say when you have that kind of, of attitude. We're to be like a sweet-smelling perfume, the the, the aroma of Christ that gently draws people in. You ever seen a horse whisperer? I remember several year, years ago, I went to some event, I forgot what it was now, and there was this guy who was demonstrating his skill as a horse whisperer. And instead of, you know, taking this wild horse and breaking it down in the usual way, he just kind of walked up very slowly and just very gently rubbed that horse on its mane and just kind of gently talked into the ear and, and led that horse. And, I mean, within a few moments, he had that horse going in the direction that he needed to go and doing what he needed the horse to do. It, it's, it's an amazing thing. And, and to me, that's kind of like a picture of what our attitude ought to be in life. We're not here to push people into anything. We're here to lead people gently, softly, with love and kindness and respect toward others. And then number five, when we sanctify Christ as Lord, we will be devoted in our lifestyle. Be devoted in your everyday lifestyle. Look at verse 16. Peter said, keep a good conscience so that in the thing in which you're slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ will be put to shame. 
If your walk doesn't match your talk, then all the fancy talking in the world doesn't really make any difference. You have to be devoted to Christ in your lifestyle. You've got to walk the walk and talk the talk. Be devoted to him. Your behavior must be different. You know, Peter said, Christ bore our sins in his body that we might die to sin and live to what? Righteousness, a right relationship with God and a right relationship with others. So he changes us inside out from the heart, up through our fingertips, down through our feet, up through our head and out of our mouths. He changes us inside out. We live with a good conscience, Peter says. So much so that no one can legitimately revile your good behavior because it is good. And people take notice of that. Paul said, our conscience testifies that we've conducted ourselves in the world with integrity and godly sincerity in 2 Corinthians 1. People will notice that. When we sanctify Christ in our hearts, we will be devoted to him in our lifestyle. And finally, number six, when we sanctify him as Lord, we will be passionate in our purpose. Be passionate in your purpose in life. Look at 1 Peter 3.14. Who is there to harm you if you prove zealous for what is good? I love this word, zealous. One of my favorite words in the Bible, prove yourself zealous for what is good. It's kind of an old-fashioned word. Word You don't hear it that much nowadays. It comes from the Greek word zeo, which means to boil or to burn brightly. And it refers to a state of passionate commitment. To burn so brightly that you're, you're passionate, you're on fire, literally, for in your commitment to Christ here. This word was even used of Jesus when it says zeal for your house will consume me. Paul said, I am zealous for God. In Titus 2.14, he said he gave himself for us to redeem us from every lawless deed and to purify for himself a people zealous for good deeds. Are you zealous this morning? Are you passionate about doing good things, about doing the right thing? about investing in the lives of other people? Are you zealous for Christ? About eternal things, things that really matter, things that have eternal value? Are you passionate about the things that matter most in life? Peter is saying that we ought to be passionate for what is good in life. Be passionate. For Christ, Be passionate for holy living. Be passionate about pointing people to hope in Christ. Be passionate about your purpose in the Lord. Isn't it a shame that we're often more passionate about things that have little or no value in the eternal scheme of things? What are you passionate about this morning? Be honest with yourself. It's an important question because people who are the most passionate are the people who change the world. And that's why I entitled this message, World Changers. If you're going to change the world, if you're going to make your mark on the world, if you're going to have an impact on the kingdom of God, you've got to be passionate about what you're doing, about your relationship with Christ and others. People who change the world are not often the most educated or the most intelligent or the most talented or wealthy or wise. Those who change the world are people who have a passionate purpose that they're willing to give their very lives for. Isn't that who we are to be as followers of Christ? You know, we all need a little fire in our lives. You can't survive without fire when you think about it. You, you need fire to cook. You need fire to stay warm. We all need some fire in our lives. 
Have you noticed that it's turned a little chilly the last few days, especially in the evening and the early mornings? I noticed that in my house the other day. It kept getting cooler and cooler and cooler in my house. And, uh, and then I noticed a strange noise emanating from my heating unit outside the house. And come to find out the fire in my gas unit had gone out. So I had the man to come and look at it. And he quickly diagnosed the problem and he said it'd be very quick and easy to fix once he got the part. And then he called back and he said the part was on a slow boat from China. <laughs> and it would be at least another week or 10 days before that part would get in. But lest you feel sorry for me, I, I've stayed warm from a different kind of fire, a different source of fire. I turned on my, my gas logs and I have stayed warm and toasty with those logs. So we all need a little fire in our lives. Did you know that Jesus loves for you to have fire in your life. In fact, he wants a little fire in your relationship with him. He doesn't want a cold relationship with you. He, he doesn't want the basic cold relationship of mundane duty and service to him. He wants us to have a white hot, zealous, passionate relationship with him as the Lord of our lives. The question is, are you willing? Do you need a little more fire in your relationship with him? Maybe you need to ask him to help you with that today. I have found that when we truly sanctify Christ as Lord in our lives and make him the highest priority in our lives, the fire will be there. It'll be there. As a matter of fact, when the fire is not there, when the zeal is not there, when you've lost your enthusiasm and your passion for life, it's a sure indication that you need to check your relationship with the living God. Because when Jesus Christ is Lord of your life, he'll give you all the fire that you need for the living of these days and for making the difference in the world. Would you pray with me? Our Heavenly Father, help us this morning to sanctify Christ as Lord of our lives. To make Him the primary object of our faith of our love, and of our hope. Lord, help us to be filled with that living hope through Christ our Lord. Help us, Lord, to be more concerned about your approval than the approval of others. Help us to be ready to stand and to speak for Christ with those around us who do not share our hope. Help us to be kind and gentle and respectful of others, to be devoted to Christ in our lifestyle and to truly be passionate in our purpose in this life. Lord, speak to us this morning. Encourage us. Draw us near to Thee. Do a new work in our lives. And we thank You for what You will do. In Christ's holy name we pray. And God's people said, Amen. We're going to stand and sing our hymn of invitation. We welcome you to come. Join our fellowship this morning. We welcome you to come and put your hope in Christ today. Whatever your need may be, as we stand and sing, you come as God speaks to you.
come now to worship our Lord through the giving of our tithes and offerings as our men come forward to receive our offering this morning. We want to pray for not only all these shoe boxes that are going out around the world, but we want to also pray for our missionaries, Akeem and Jamie Smith, they're serving the Lord out in Oakland, California. We want to pray for them and all of our missionaries around the world this morning. And Brother Mark Infinger is going to come now to lead us in our prayer. Heavenly Father, we seek your blessing. Lord, not so much over us, but over these boxes this morning. God, that these things and these boxes and the message that will accompany it will, will be effective, strong in the hearts of the young people and the workers and the parents, anyone who comes in contact with these boxes, Lord. Father, we pray the same thing for our tithes. That as they go, those times support the mission field and our church and our local community, that the gospel will go with it. They will see a blessing that you pour out on the people because of what we give today. God, I pray a blessing for Akeem and Jamie Smith. Lord, that your gospel will be strong and working where they are. Lord, that they will see baptisms, that they will see new people coming into the, the faith, God, that they will find new people who are trusting in you and support their ministry fully. I pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. It seemed like everything is upside down. It seemed like things are out of control. And I would be worried and upset except for one thing. I know who's in control. And I know who holds tomorrow. I don't know about tomorrow. I just live from day to day. I don't borrow from its sunshine, for its skies may turn to gray. I don't worry for the future. For I know what Jesus said And today I'll walk beside him For he knows what is ahead And many things about tomorrow I don't seem to understand but I know who holds tomorrow, and I know who holds my hand. I don't know about the future. It may bring me poverty, but the one who feeds that little sparrow out there, he's the same one who takes care of me. And although the road before me may be through the flame or flood, Still his presence goes before me and I'm covered, praise God, I'm covered by his blood and many things about tomorrow I don't seem to understand, but I tomorrow and I know who 
Thank you, Brother Jim Todd, for singing that this morning. It's good to see you and your lovely wife, Susan, doing so much better. Good to have you back with us. Uh, let me just uh, remind you that uh, this is the last opportunity to get your deacon vote in, so be sure and do that uh, if you haven't already turned that in before you leave this morning. And uh, also tonight, we're going to have just a fellowship time, game night uh, tonight, and uh, so we hope that you'll come and join us at 5 o'clock for our snack supper. And then, uh, of course, no Wednesday night activities this week. Hope you all have a wonderful Thanksgiving holiday. Okay? Let's stand for our closing prayer together. Brother Frank Couch is going to come and lead us as we pray. Dear Father, Lord, as we come before you now, Lord, as we come together as a <clears throat> church family and worship you, and Lord, praise you, Lord, we thank you for these times and opportunities that we have to serve you. Lord, we just pray that the community around us, Lord, that we're able to serve them and help them see who you are through our actions and through our words and deeds. Lord, we ask now as we come into this next week of uh, families, families getting together and celebrating, Lord, it's a time of thanksgiving, Lord, as we pause and give thanks for, for you, for the blessings that you've bestowed upon us, Lord. We just help, <clears throat> hope that we help and, and praise those around us as we do you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. <clears throat>